walked up to the pastor at the close of the service. She was all about so high, here. little Heather. And uh, she said to the pastor, looking right in the, looking at him right in the face, you bored me today. <laughs> well, Mother overheard that, and Mother got after little Heather and uh, told her not to ever say that again. Well, a couple of Sundays later, I don't know whether she forgot, but she walked up to the pastor and said, you did it again. I hope that nobody will say that to me when I get through. I'm talking today about a man by the name of Paul. A velvet said, but you can't say a whole lot more than that he did rock and roll. You can say a lot more about Paul, and yet I've never heard of anybody celebrating Paul's birthday or his death or anything else. But I think we should have a Paul day. Paul prayed. And an earthquake came and shook the foundations of the jail in which he and Silas were in prison and set the prisoners loose. He prayed. They praised God. And he preached unto the jailer who was going to take his life because he thought the prisoners were going to get away and his, he guarded them with his own life. He preached to him, then he practiced. He baptized the man and his household following this experience. Paul also besides that persevered. I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. And that's an important thing for us to do, is to persevere. And then last of all, Paul paid. He paid with his life for his service to the Lord Jesus Christ. These men had turned the world upside down. And it was because, one verse says, it was because of envy that they had sought to get rid of Paul and Silas. The same expression is used by, or known to be in the mind of Pilate when he was trying Jesus. He knew it was because of envy that they had delivered him up. I want you to notice that the parallels between Paul and Christ as we go through the message this morning. God needed someone to lead the way, to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, and to set the other people straight. And he finally chose a man by the name of Paul. And uh, somebody might ask right off, why would they choose a man like Paul? Because of what he did. Uh, Galatians 1.13, Paul said, Ye have heard how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. And we have quite a number of passages of Scripture where it, it details uh, some of the things that Paul did and how that he uh, was able to get authority from the chief priests and the scribes to uh, do away with many of the Christians. And uh, he spent a lot of time going about seeking how he could destroy Christianity. He was on his way to Damascus when God caused him to be converted. And from that time on, instead of fighting against the church, he worked for it. I don't know what kind of a man Paul was by size. They talked like his bodily presence was not much. But his voice and his message was great. And I hope we'll see that as we go along this morning. Paul, in writing to Timothy, said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. I hope when we do something wrong that it's due to our ignorance, unbelief. That we're not deliberately trying to do something against the cause of Christ.
I wish to call your attention to a passage of scripture in the book of Philippians, the first chapter, verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be that magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. A very strange statement, I'm sure it is to us when the first, the first time we read it at least. What in the world could Paul mean when he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain? When I first started out in the ministry, I was told that that gain was for Paul. Paul had a hard, rough life to live. And uh, because of that, uh, if he died, he, his problems of that nature would be over. And I preached that for a number of years. So somebody taught me the law of the context, the scripture surrounding it. Now, after reading this verse again, uh, see if you think Paul would be thinking of himself and his own comfort when he said, to die is gain. According to my expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Christ magnified in his body by death. Paul was not thinking of himself and of the fact that he his uh, problem would end when he died, but he was thinking of becoming a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to give you one, one a very good uh, example of the importance of the context when you're interpreting scripture. I had a very good friend uh, in Riverside, California, uh, an elderly man that had a rescue mission and worked in jails and street corner holding meetings, a wonderful Christian man. But he had one thing that I didn't agree with him on, he didn't believe in the resurrection of the wicked. I said, Brother Chandler, he was a brother of a man that had, had charge of the Los Angeles Times who had offered him money and position, but he turned it down to serve the Lord. He was a, a wonderful Christian man. First, I heard he was suffering a lot from a very bad case of shingles, and I went over there to comfort him, but uh, from that time on, I went over there to be comforted and to be blessed myself by this great Christian. I said, Brother Chandler, will you give me a list of verses for this idea that the wicked dead will not be raised? And uh, at the top of his list was this verse. Uh, if you want a good illustration sometimes for the importance of following the context, it's found in Isaiah, the 26th chapter, verse 14. They are dead. They shall not live. They are deceased. They shall not rise. Therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory perish. Of course, that wouldn't be said about the good people, the saved people, though the only folks left are the bad people, the wicked people, the people who fail to accept Christ. But is that what he's talking about here? We look at the context, just one verse before that. Verse 13, it's unlucky for that doctrine if you read verse 13. O Lord our God, other lords besides thee have had dominion over us, but by thee only will we make mention of thy name. They are dead. They shall not rise. They are deceased. They shall not rise. Therefore hast thou visited them and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. He's not talking about people at all. He's talking about the false gods. So to take that passage of scripture and use it to teach about wicked people not being raised from the dead, no, no matter whether they are or aren't, I'm not arguing that today. But uh, that verse alone is not one that you would take. Well, it, I talked to the Brett Chandler for a half an hour before he saw the light. And finally said, oh, brother boy, he says, I'll never read that verse again. 
but he had used it, he said, for 40 years to preach this doctrine of the non-resurrection of the wicked, and that was uh, his, one of his favorite verses right at the top of the list. So you see the importance of following the context, and that's what we must do when we listen to Paul's word uh, concerning his gain to die. Paul wanted to be a martyr for Christ. They put their garments at his feet when Stephen, the first martyr, was stoned to death. And I can imagine that that experience had a great, great, strong impression, made a strong impression upon his mind, upon his heart. To see that man stand there, uh, even crying out, God forgive them, or, or they know not what they do, or lay not this sin to their charge, is what he said. He was uh, following the, the pattern of Jesus, who said, lay not this sin to their charge. In John, the closing verses of the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus is talking to Peter, and uh, he told him someday they're going to take you where you don't want to go and they're going to stretch forth your hands and uh, you're not going to like it. And John says, This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. We don't usually think of death as glorifying anybody. But that's how Peter was going to do it. And Paul was going to glorify God too. In Philippians, the third chapter, verse 10, how I long to share his suffering, that is Christ's suffering, and to die as he died. When Paul said to die as gain, he was thinking of gain for the Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul and Silas were at the home of Philip the Evangelist, uh, a knock came to the door, and they opened the door, and there was a prophet by the name of Agabus standing there. They invited him in, and he went and he took Paul's girdle or belt off and tied his own hands and feet with them and said that uh, that same thing would happen to Paul when he went into Jerusalem. said, I'm not only willing to be bound in Jerusalem, but to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Can you imagine this man, he just wants to become a martyr even for the cause of Christ. And just to take a peek into his life to see some of the other things that this great man endured. Uh, 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, starting with verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, beyond measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. And that was a, such a severe beating that sometimes people would die from it. So they passed a law that if they were to be beaten, that would, couldn't be more than 39 strikes. Thrice was I beaten with rods, and I don't imagine they were little taps when people gave him the hit with a rod. Once I was stoned, and that time he was left out to the edge of the town that's dead. People who had stoned him said, well, that's enough for him. He's gone. We won't be bothered with his teachings anymore. And so they went off, but his friends stood around about him, and pretty soon his eyes blinked and opened. He moved around a bit, and finally he got up and went into the city where people lived in their stone. This great man Paul, what a, what a man he was as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ set a similar example for him when after he had told the people, his disciples, that he was going to uh, have to go to Jerusalem and be killed, and the third day rise again, uh, 
after they had made this expression to them, it says he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. You'd think he'd want to go to Spain or some other place instead of going to Jerusalem uh, when he was going to uh, be killed, crucified. He said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Well, it looks like death uh, is prevailing when I think of all the people who have gone from this church alone, who have died. It looks like death, Hades, has prevailed against the church, that part of it. But if we go on a little further, we find out that the reason they're not, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church is because of the resurrection. Paul said in the 15th of 1 Corinthians, Death is swallowed up in victory. O grave, where is thy victory? The victory of the grave is gone when people are raised from it. I want to let you in on a little secret here about Paul and this word hell, which is comes from the word Hades, and another word is used by uh, was used by Jesus maybe a half a dozen times repeated in the Synoptic Gospels, but he used the word Gehenna when he was talking about the punishment of the wicked that be cast into hell. Having better to have one eye and be saved than to have two eyes and be cast into hell. And the same about an arm and a leg. He used this word because it was an illustration to the Jewish people. Out to the south of the city of Jerusalem, there was a city garbage dump. It was always smoke rising from the place because they burned up the trash of the city and what wouldn't burn, the maggots or the worms would eat up. And so he used that as an illustration of what would happen to the wicked. It's strange that Paul, who had said he had declared the whole counsel of God unto them, and had held back nothing that was profitable, never used the word Gehenna. He was a pro the prophet or the apostle unto the Gentiles, and they weren't acquainted with that uh, awfully smelly, dirty place at the south of Jerusalem, the city garbage dump. So he never used that word, and this verse that I use here, the gates of hell, or Hades, shall not, uh, uh, where is thy victory? That word Hades is the only time he used that one. So if you study Paul's ministry, he doesn't spend a lot of time talking about a fiery burning hell, uh, which uh, he apparently didn't believe in. He talked mostly of destruction and perishing. The only other apostle who wrote or, and used part of the New Testament and used the word Gehenna was James. And I was puzzled because Paul wrote most of the New Testament, a big share of it and never used that word Gehenna. And here's a fellow by the name of James who wrote one little book and he used it only once. He said, the tongue is set on fire of Gehenna. The word in your King James, I think, is hell. James, I finally found out as I sat and, and meditated upon it was the reason he used that word was because he was preaching, teaching, writing to the twelve tribes scattered abroad, as it says in the very first verse of his book. They knew about that place, these twelve tribes that had been coming to Jerusalem year after year for the Passover and various things, and I suppose at least the kids would see the smoke rising up down there in the south. Let's go to the fire. Well, that's no fire, that's just a garbage dump, they were told. So they knew what uh, James was talking about when he used this word Gehenna because it was a familiar term to them in their language and uh, the meaning was clear. There are some folks who think that death is a gate to glory, but Paul does not agree with that. Paul says the resurrection is the gate to glory. He says if there, Christ be not raised, we are yet in our sins, we are uh, we're, we're our faith is vain, it's useless, and they also which have fallen asleep in Christ are perished. That's the end of them, unless there's a resurrection. So the resurrection is the gate to glory from which God's people will come one of these days.
Then he uses the expression to live is Christ. I wonder how many of us could say that today. For me to live is Christ. For me to live is for Christ to live. The same as Christ being here living. Maybe you've had a moment or two once in a while in your life where uh, somebody came up and told you that you had influenced their life and helped them to become a Christian. Uh, and maybe then you could say, for me to live is Christ. But how about the good share of our time? Could we say that? I'm sure we couldn't say it like Paul did. If when you do well, and you suffer and be taken patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Paul was following Jesus. And the one verse that says, follow me as I follow Jesus. Following Jesus is an important thing. And we ought to be careful whom we follow. I read once of a man who was quite a heavy drinker. And uh, after quite a snowstorm, he had been cooped up in the house. He decided to go down to the tavern and have a drink. So he put on his heavy winter clothes and started out across the field through the deep snow heading for the tavern. He heard a noise and he looked back and he saw his little son walking along trying to step in his big tracks to come through the snow to follow him. And that made quite an impression on that man to think that his son was following him. And we ought to have, have a great impression on our minds to follow the Lord Jesus Christ because he will lead us to the right place. Would others recognize Jesus in us? There is a gospel according to you. That's the only gospel that some people may read. Are you living such a Christian life that if they were to follow you, they would be saved, they would be one to the Lord? It's very important to live the Christian life Within a two-week period, I heard uh, three different people say that one of the greatest testimonies, witnesses there is to Christianity is somebody who is living daily the Christian life. <coughs> one such person was Wilbur Nelson, the head of the uh, morning chapel hour that you hear over the radio quite frequently. I knew him just as a young fellow when he was with first mate Bob in the good ship Grace. He said that, that it was so important for people to live the Christian life every day, not make any missteps like some people have and have uh, sort of turned the church life upside down with the loss of millions of dollars recently in the history of, of the church and evangelism over the TV. For in Him we live and move and have our being. That is, in Jesus we live and move and have our being. Again, Paul said to the Galatian churches, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. When Paul walked down the street, it was just about like when Christ walked down the street because he was so consecrated and dedicated to him and living the Christian life. There was a book that was written, it was a very popular book years ago, In His Steps, or What Would Jesus Do, by Charles Sheldon. If you've never read that book, you ought to read it. It tells the story of a church that decided to do just that. Whenever they were, were faced with a question or something, what they were going to do, they'd stop. What would Jesus do in this instance? And it's revolutionized the church, as it will often do in our lives if we'll ask ourselves the same question. If every church member were just like me, what kind of a church would my church be? Think about that question a little. And there's another sentence sermon I use occasionally. Uh, if you were accused of being a Christian, 
Would they find enough evidence to condemn you? That, those two little work, uh, lines should give us something for serious thought. If every church member were just like me, what kind of a church would my church be? These for early Christians, it says when they were persecuted, dragged into before the councils and punished, it says, therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Instead of going and hiding away and keeping quiet about it, they spread it. And the, the expression uh, was quite popular some years ago, the seed of the, or the blood of the martyrs has become the seed of the church. People were converted, I think, because when they saw Stephen Stone and some of the others uh, whose lives were taken because of their faith in Christ. It's going to take two important things, more things, but two that I want to call your attention to now in closing. One is cooperation. One evening, about six o'clock, people were sitting about their table eating supper, some had finished. Mother was doing her dishes, the kids were playing in the playroom. But all of a sudden, the radios and the TV stopped. They were told that there were two airplane pilots flying around over the city in the fog. And they couldn't land because they had no instruments to land by. All they could do was crash into the buildings or the mountains roundabout. Fourteen of them were there to start out with. Eight of them flew directly to the field when they saw the fog coming in. Four of them crashed into the field, leaving the two of them flying around up there, unable to tell just where to go. The call came for people to drive their cars off to Camp Miramar, which is just north of San Diego. 2,500 responded to the call. They left their supper tables, they left their reading, whatever they were doing, and got out in that blinding fog and headed for Camp Miramar. They surrounded the field with their headlights pointed into the field. When the signal was given, all lights on, over 5,000 headlights came on at once, flashing great light over the landing field. And the commercial plane went up and guided the two men down to safety. Now one man could have been there, probably even a dozen or more, and then they'd never been able to make a landing. But because the people responded as they did, they were able to get out there in time to save these two flyers. Now that may seem like quite an experience. Well, I went through the same thing myself. I was flying from Oakland, California to San Diego, and uh, it was raining when we left Los Angeles and went up above the clouds, and there, as far as you could see, in every direction was really a billowy white cloud. It was like great mounds of pure white cotton. And then all of a sudden, the, the, they begin to turn red and orange and yellow. And that was the most beautiful sight I think I've ever seen. And uh, they got down as far as San Diego, and they were told that they couldn't land because the fog was so heavy over the regular city landing field that they wouldn't be able to do it. And they were told to go out to Camp Miramar. Well, I sat there in the plane looking out there and all I could see was fog. And uh, how is this man going to get down there through that and make a safe landing? Well, they flew by instruments and that beam of electric current or whatever it was, I don't understand just all about it, but uh, they were able to put the machine on the plane, connect it up with that beam of uh, uh, electricity and it brought it, brought it safely into the landing field. And it took longer for the taxis to come out and pick us up than it did for the plane to go from Los Angeles to, to pass it or to uh, San Diego. The 
that was some experience. I, I knew somewhat how those fellows felt in their plane when they couldn't see where to go and uh, bigger than maybe half the land. I, I thought up two or three very short, quick sermons to preach to the people if, they, if it looked like they weren't going to make it and uh, uh, got all upset. I was going to try to calm them down and tell them what they could do to be saved. But we made a safe landing and I didn't get to preach that sermon. I hope we never have to. That's one of those same circumstances. Cooperation is what brought those young men safely in. And there's another illustration using the airplane that I wish to use in closing. In Chico, California, they had an Army airfield. And there was a young flyer up there in a single place plane flying around and all of a sudden he was stricken with blindness. You can imagine that. That's just as bad as the fall, isn't it? If not worse. What could happen to that young man stricken with blindness flying around 3,000 feet above the field? For a tense five minutes, his plane flew unguided through the skies. Seal, the name of the young man, screaming into his radio. In the control tower below, Colonel C.W. Thaxton heard the youth shouting, I'm blind, I'm blind, I'm blind. For the next 15 minutes, in a calm, well-modulated voice, according to this newspaper item, Thaxton talked to the youth instilling in him confidence and courage. Follow my instructions implicitly, he told Seal over the radio. For nearly 10 minutes, he kept Seal and his plane circling over the field until the field was cleared and an ambulance was summoned. Seal did what he was told and brought his plane in for a perfect landing. Friends, we need to keep in touch with the control tower. There's somebody in the control tower that can bring us in for a safe landing on the judgment day. But if we lose our connection with him, fail to follow his rules and instructions, we're in for a crash landing. May God help each one of us to do our very best to follow the leading and the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is there in the control tower pleading in our behalf. He said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. There will never be a time when there won't be somebody in the control tower to listen to you. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. May God help each one of us to keep in touch with the control tower, the Lord Jesus Christ, our captain, the captain of our faith, and to work with others in cooperation and doing what we can to reach them with the gospel. Like those early Christians, that turned the world upside down and says they went everywhere preaching the gospel. Does your life preach a little sermon to those you work with, those you might be playing with, whatever you're doing? God help us to do what we can to reap a harvest of people for God's eternal kingdom. Now shall we turn and closing to number 103.